I'm going to ask, uh, get see if we can get Catherine and Anthony up here now. I feel like we could talk all night, Sophie. We're going to keep, please stay with us into this next part of the conversation if you can. Um, and so we'll chat with Anthony and, and Catherine for the next 15 minutes and then we'll break out. So you, all of you who are listening on, listening in so attentively and sharing so much have a chance to talk about this with each other um, on video. Anthony, how are you doing? Welcome to Rebel hey. Book Club. Hey, Catherine, welcome. How's it going, everyone? Really good. So, Anthony, let's dive straight in. So I was there on Twitter last week, not as prolific as uh, Sophie here, but um, I do spend a lot of time there and, and I do love that. I do quite like the, the kind of conflict, the conflict that you see on Twitter because it leads to discomfort and then sometimes breakthroughs where it's less of an echo chamber than other social media networks. But anyway, I, I, I shared your campaign and for someone like me who's like, you know, gets a few retweets occasionally. Uh, you know, a week later, it's been shared on my Twitter profile 70,000 times. I'm like, whoa, I feel like I'm stealing Greenpeace's glory here. But no, I've had all sorts of action, like a glimpse into Sophie's world. Um, but tell us a little bit about how you got into, I guess, what we would now call digital activism and your role at Greenpeace. Um, yeah, thank you, by the way, for <laughs> tweeting that out. No, oh, it's very helpful. Amazing um, campaign and video. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I guess like digital activism, it, it was mostly after uni, um, I like worked as a street fundraiser for Greenpeace down at uni. And that's kind of when I realized that the environmental cause is a cause that I can like throw my weight behind without getting burnt out as quickly, although that is maybe TBC for now. Um, but yeah i after uni i knew that greenpeace was kind of the like ideal for me so I, I i did a lot of like grassroots campaigning and and local group activism as well and i think because i was the youngest member in the divestment like pension fund divestment um campaign group that i was in i was kind of told to do social media which is fine because i've like i do social media i've grown up with it um and then, that's just that's just a smart tactic a career tactic anthony is like Pick the pick the one campaign where there's no one under twenty in it, you know, divestment from fossil fuels for pensions. Uh, there's no kids there. I'll go in and dominate on on socials. Well, and look was, where you are now. I was I was like twenty. I went to uni late, so I was like twenty four or five when when I when I like left. But um, yeah, I it it helped that I'd like done all the things. Like I applied for a paid internship. I didn't even really know what the position was and like necessarily what the things that we had to do were, but it turns out that it was all the things that I had been doing. Um, and then I, you know, I got quite lucky obviously to, to be able to get that internship. And then I got even luckier to be able to like stay on and they made a junior role for me to go to the level that I'm at now, which is kind of the digital campaigner role, but there's like a junior digital campaigner role, which they made. Um, so I'm very lucky and you know, it's, it's not, always like that simple for a lot of people so I definitely feel like quite grateful to be here um you know at, at kind of this age well in the world of digital marketing and I'm sure it's the same in activism it's all about the metrics right and then hopefully leading to policy change at the end and so if you're measured by that it's not luck because you're churning out some big big data from your uh, from where you're working Anthony give us a quick insight or two if you can into what the hell's going on in the world of digital activism because we've seen you know, for those of us that try and support and engage with different causes, like a lot of compassion fatigue. We're hearing from people tonight. Um, I, you know, still feeling overwhelmed by all the different challenges that where to put their time, energy, and money. Like, what's going on in digital activism? Has the pandemic lived? Has it risen? You know, is it greater number? We see more momentum, easier to change, or is it clicktivism? You know, harder to engage people through now. I, I do. Uh, yeah, I think because everyone is online now. Um, I think activism has had to move online even more so as a result of the pandemic. And um, yeah, it, it, there have obviously been challenges with, you know, cut through. There've obviously, this has been a very busy year in terms of like political events, like Black Lives Matter, COVID, what's happening now in Israel and Palestine. You know, it, it doesn't slow down. Um, but we, we've managed to have success on a few campaigns, like uh, the campaign that I worked on last time, uh, last year, was was successful with, within the limits that we were trying to get it with, successful within. 
um, and we, we definitely found some engagement. It obviously didn't get millions of views and 70,000 likes on Twitter, but it managed to have the impact that we were hoping to get, which is, you know, MP engagement and a, a fair amount of like press and yeah, it's, I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I have the answers because Greenpeace as well is like quite a specific, it's an organization and there are grassroots people doing incredible activism that in two years will probably copy their tactics, but they're, they're doing it right now. Um, and whether that's like small informative vi videos on like TikTok that are being shared millions of times around the world, or, um, you know, like just Instagram lives of influencers that are spreading the causes um, from like different audiences. But like these, are, these are things that like younger people are doing that um, Greenpeace will hopefully like, you know, adapt to and you know everyone should try and copy from because yeah you know the youth is basically who are going to make change hopefully most of the time absolutely and a question perhaps for you and and sophie on this and then we'll come catherine to your your amazing story but um does the playbook of digital activism so likes clicks signatures does it you know does it play out so if you get volume like you've just got on this recycling uh horror story um, in the last week with this brilliant sort of, you know, Wallace and Gromit style pics uh, animation. Does the volume there and the signatures, does it does it lead to change? If, do you see that Greenpeace and Sophie, have you have you seen that in your work as well? Or is it is it much harder to predict where you know, a popular campaign will or won't change, make a real impact on the future? You're both on mute. Anyone can jump in. Sophie. I was going to let Anthony go first. Um, Anthony, you're back. There you go. Thank you, Sophie. Um, yeah, I, I think impact is always a hard word to define uh, because mm -hmm. is impact like winning your campaign or is impact like educating or broadening the, broadening the conversation? Um, so I will, I will basically say that I, I think digital activism always has some impact um, and you know that there are like digital activism can be like getting your your supporters to sign an MP tool and then getting loads of MPs to sign a thing which then creates news or something like that um, and likewise it could be uh, what's a good example I had an example but it slipped from my head um, it, it it can just be like a well yeah we we during a Barclays campaign we asked a bunch of we asked Barclays customers to pledge to leave their bank if the bank didn't commit to uh, stopping fueling tar sands. That's a very long explanation, sorry. Um, but we got to a stage where 3,000 people had pledged to leave Barclays Bank. And that, like, while Barclays, you know, are still unfortunately funding tar sands, like, there is definitely, there's, there was news around it. We toxified their brand a bit, like, they lost money and, yeah, it's just impact's a hard word to define, but I'll, I'll always say like digital activism has impact. So keep, we should keep signing those signatures on the uh, uh, for, for the parliament to get them over the line. It's an easy thing to do, so it's good to hear it works. Uh, and Sophie, what's your reflection on where digital activism is at? I I think I think what I would say is that um, it it supports and complements um, other forms of activism. I don't I don't think any one type of activism is effective alone i think what's been really interesting watching watching the trend to sort of signing online petitions come full circle i think it 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 was wonderful to see things like change.org take off and and to watch you know campaigners um and people who wanted to organize for change to 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 see that there was a way that they could um come together digitally um to pressure government and to pressure ministers it was then very interesting to see how quickly that um, how quickly that became. Uh, uh, I don't want to say overused; these things are never ever overused, but but became popular to the point of the camp. It, it was, be, I think, some campaigning became became quite difficult to distinguish. I mean, I remember there was a point where my mum sent me four change.org uh, emails to sign in the in a, in in a week, and I thought. Like I don't, you know, I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed by these. I wonder, I wonder how effective they are. And I think what's been really interesting to see is, and I, I interview a lot of young activists. Um, uh, I do have a column for Grazia magazine that I do on modern activism, and I'm 
constantly learning from young people and, and what I, she said, sounding like a geriatric, um, but what I find really interesting is that that digital piece, that sort of online petitioning, actually, I think, is increasingly working the other way around, that it's the first thing people do. And then from that digital petitioning, they move offline to meet each other, to campaign, to to march, to meet in vigils, to, you know, it, it's a vital, I think digital campaigning gets people very engaged. It also, I think, is getting people to a place where they understand what other options are available to them. And I think, I think lockdown has been really interesting in this regard because on the one hand, we have been absolutely separate from one another. And in another regard, we've become much closer to our communities than we were before. When you think of the work that has gone on within communities to support the more vulnerable members, the people who are shielding, the older members, um, you know, the single parents that, you know, I think there's been an awful lot of very hyper local activism mm. that has potentially been encouraged via a digital awareness of what's going on and then has gone, uh, has moved away from digital. So I just, I think, um, I think you can have a huge impact on social media. I, everybody I speak to uses social media very significantly and very strategically, but I think, um, and as Edje Temelkaran, who I interviewed for my book, said, you know, you know who you are on the street and you're standing mm -hmm. shoulder to shoulder with people that it gives you an energy that is totally different. So I think the two things will always necessarily work together. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great synopsis of what's going on. Now, talking of the birth of sort of digital signatures and petitions, Catherine, you were there, right, at, at the sort of the early days of change.org. Um Take us, take us back to, to how you got involved with that, what's happened since. Yeah, and it was, I agree a lot with the analysis from Anthony and Sophie there. So I am, um, I, I'm sort of a campaigner by background and was working for sort of different charities and the media campaigns team and um, got, um, went off to work at this unknown website called change.org going back a while now, dating myself when, and no one really, it was this US thing and people I didn't really know what I was joining, to be honest, but I was told we're going to build something that puts the tools of campaigning in the hands of anyone. So rather than kind of campaigning on behalf of people, what it, what is it like to actually support people to campaign for themselves? So that was what sold me. And I remember sitting in the office and we were trying to get people to start petitions and no one really knew what online petitions were. And journalists were like, what is this? <laughs> whenever we pitched them something but over time you know we started I think one of the first petitions that took off on the site was Nick's fight which was a, a guy who'd lost his life to cancer and the insurance company was refusing to pay out on a tiny technicality on his form um, and his friends sort of started organizing and then Stephen Fry tweeted out the petition and then suddenly it became a thing and the company was sort of forced to back back down after a bit of press coverage and that was the first time we thought well, maybe there's something here that might just work. And then Ian Duncan Smith went on the radio and said, benefits are uh, too generous. I could live on 50 quid a week. So um, that sort of started at, we petition off the back of that. And we had this crazy Easter weekend where, you know, suddenly the site was taking off and journalists who had dismissed it before were interested. So it was this amazing journey. And we saw, you know, Caroline Corrado Perez get a woman on a banknote. So that kind of energy that Actually, if you're someone with an idea and something you want to change, you can you could start something and you could get some legitimacy from other people signing your petition, I think was a was amazing. And Laura Corton, who's done, you know, ended the tampon tax. Or I see quite a lot of like young feminists that are sort of inspired by that route and and young people that are sort of much more willing to take action, but also agree that it's I've sort of seen that that take off and then almost to the point where petitions are quite ubiquitous and there's so many of them and how do you stand out and and really feeling that it does take a lot more now to cut through um, and it takes so much more than just what you know how many are on a petition in a way the numbers start to feel a bit irrelevant I think over time there was a time when you know no petition would really get a hundred thousand and now it's you know it's so much easier um, so actually the last three years when I left change I sort of was trying to think well a lot of the people that start something and even when they win something especially through online activism there's a point where they think okay well I won this this small kind of um, tactical win but how do I start changing the system how do we change the policy and actually that journey is a lot longer and needs a lot much more support you need 
press tactics and political tactics and allies and collaborations. And I ended up slightly by accident, but I've spent the last three and a bit years um, doing almost the opposite of online ag- activism and going to work with the Grenfell families in West London. So much deeper community activism, supporting them with their fight for justice and change, what that looks like to, for them as families, but also how do you get politicians that said they would make change and gave you all the promises under the sun, you know, four years ago now, but, are, you know, aren't sticking to those. How do you actually make deep change for people in social housing? So, yeah a sort of a real i'm and for those for those it's, it's a really it's a really powerful um story your story of like where, where you've gone so far and also what's next which we'll share in a second but that we've got an international crowd in tonight so mm. for for those that don't know the grenfell united community that you you helped support for the last three years it came off the back of this this awful fire on the social housing block in london right yeah so 72 people lost their lives in the grenfell tower fire which was a a uh, huge tower block in West London um you know you can see it for miles around and and it burnt down and it burnt down for a huge number of reasons it was clad in basically petrol cl- cladding effectively and we've had like decades of the building industry just ignoring you know getting away with murder literally in terms of the the stuff that they were putting on buildings cost cutting etc and also the local council in the area which i think happens in many countries this kind of regeneration where they're trying to force out people that have been social housing tenants for a long time and not caring for people that are you know have grown up and lived in their communities for decades doing what they can to run them down and pre- the story of Grenfell is that pre the fire the residents were organizing and were campaigning and were trying to be heard and one of them Ed Defan, had a blog where um, along with someone else where he was documenting how they were being mistreated by the council and they were ignored and ignored and one of their blogs said you know, it's going to take a massive fire for someone to take notice of what's going on on in these tower blocks and for people in social housing. And he in a million years would not have thought that that would have actually happened to them, but that's what happened. And since then, they've been campaigning, not, you know, for themselves, for justice, but actually because they know that so many more people across the UK and probably around the world in social housing are treated appallingly badly. So they're trying to win change and win power for for residents and communities so yeah quite a gear shift from online mm. petitioning. it changed all but it's been a very um yeah learned a huge amount in the last few years from them and so, so just, activism in a way so you've done the digital activism you've now had this street community activism uh work and experience what's i know you've, you're you're literally launching a new project now so tell us how tell us briefly what it is and this is maybe an opportunity for people who are listening tonight to get involved yeah well i'll give you the quick the quick plug so it's called breakthrough and it's sort of pulling together a lot of the experience of the last few years and before that so we're going to support um we're looking for grassroots groups and community groups that are campaigning for change and um we're going to support them through an accelerated program like a year's full wraparound support, press support, movement building support, creative support. We've got this incredible network of people from the creative industries, movement builders, a whole host of experts who, you know, pro bono are going to come in and support these communities to lead lead their change. And I think it's based on the fact that it takes time. So you need, you know, in-depth support. And also the playing field isn't level, you know, and there's something we've learned from Grenfell and elsewhere that, you know, the companies that you're campaigning against, that, you know, the government that you're campaigning against is lobbyists and PR companies and all of these other people that are out there that mean the playing field isn't level. So what would it like to be like to provide, you know, grassroots groups, some of the, some of the kit that, you know, who they're up against is up and level that playing field a bit more. So it's called Breakthrough, breakthroughimpact.org if you want to check it out. Yeah, here we go. (laughs) Putting the five rules into an accelerator. Move so over tech startups. This is the one that this is I was the one also that... an outsider, Sophie, when you were saying that. <laughs> hey, hey, listen, and when you start that conversation, we're gonna be here for another hour. But but what I wanted to do is that I, there's so much, so much um richness here. I wanted to bring one, try and bring a theme of the questions that members are asking to give you the three of you a sort of final question. And then we're going to go to our breakout room so people can really connect with each other. And if you'd like to join us there, you'd be very welcome. So there's quite a few people who on the same theme have been saying, if, you know, how can you be a good supporter essentially? If you're, if you're not an outsider, 
if you're if you're not like deep in the cause or you haven't experienced that real pain or or you haven't fallen into a real a real campaign yourself how can you how can you be a good supporter um and what can you do day to day like other than signing petitions how can you start this process um so you've all got a shot at answering or picking something um, out or leaving us with an insight or an anecdote that you'd like to sophie i'm going to be brutally frank i'm going to say give people money um, when I left the Women's Equality Party, I left with an understanding of how much money it costs to get women elected and how hard it is from anybody from a minoritised community to run for political office, let alone get elected, uh, which is why we set up Activate, which is, you know, it's, it's essentially a fund to um, help uh, female community activists, particularly um, women of colour, disabled women, uh, working class women, um, to run community projects and also then to fund and uh, support their uh, political campaigns. Um, you know, there's a lot of money washing around the system. If you can spare cold, hard cash to give to people, then do. I mean, I, you know, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but no, it's a, it's a really important nobody answer. Has and, and bit, uh, nobody has mentioned bit... money yet tonight, and it is a key part of a successful campaign. And if you're, do, do you go with your head or your heart with money? Do you say, let's say you've got a, a you've got your little stack here. You do go, right, my heart says this because I've been pulled in emotionally. Or do you say, right, there's 10 causes that cover these 10, you know, you, you know what, what an investor would spread bet to have the maximum impact. We read Doing Good Better years ago, which is all about this like, you know, effective, altru effective altruism, right? How do you invest time and money most effectively? So what's your... What's your advice there? Uh, I I would say um, uh, look at outcomes and and deliverables. I know that sounds terrible, but like you know, look at look to see what the people you want to invest in are are aiming to do. Um, have a you know consider how um, consider what their plan to do it is. Um, there's a lot of charismatic people out there. Um, uh, there's a lot of talkers. Um, uh, there's also quite a lot of quieter people who are really trying to think through um, how to deliver the change. Um, I, I think um, I, I I I can't answer the question about go with your heart or go with your head because I think it's a I think it's a, a false premise. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you should have to choose one over the other. I've always you know I've I've always gone with my gut just to add a third you know, part of the anatomy there. <laughs> the first brain, as we learned when we read the book on gut. Um, I'm Anthony, I'm going to pass, if it's all right, Sophie, just pass the mic briefly over to Anthony. What is your what is your advice or reflection on this question? Um, yeah, I would, unfortunately, I'd, say, I'd definitely agree. Money is extremely important. And um, yeah, Greenpeace is, is a, there's a huge organization that has a lot of money and that is how we manage to do effective campaigns um and sometimes campaigns that are you know maybe less effective and still manage to do another one after that um yeah it's i i, I come across like you know there are so many things that you that you know you want to help with and there is only so much that you can and i think like just listening to uh you everyone speak actually today has made me feel better because I, you know, there's a lot of self doubt, um, like all the time about, uh, what am I doing? Is it enough? Can I do more? Should I, should I, you know, should I do this? Should I do the other? And, uh, I feel like if you, yeah, I mean, I, I have asked my friends when I've said like, who should I donate to? And they've said, these people are good donate here. And that to me, will help me in some way um just to feel like i don't have to you know constantly check for the next thing that needs my support um because yeah i i i totally feel the burnout that like sometimes everyone gets and i just feel like it's important to know that there's a level where you can stop so do what you can with donating with giving your time with the digital activism but um don't like necessarily beat yourself up for not doing not giving everything you have uh, because you, you need to keep some of that for yourself sometimes just like your own mental self uh, not necessarily like your possessions and stuff but just like your your mental energy and all of that 
Yeah, and I, I just build on what you just said, Anthony. I've always approached donations like a, like shopping, which is essentially, in my mind, it's like where which of these organizations and brands have the values that match the things that I care about or the things I might want to care about more in the world and then start giving something a little bit and then you become more engaged. And that's the beauty of donating is you, you're drawn into the story because there's some accountability there and so on. So, um, so yeah, and the return on investment is much bigger than buying a coffee when you donate. Um, Catherine, final word for the session from you. What would you like to add? Um, on the question of how to support stuff, I think, yeah, agree with money. Um, also, I think, think about what skills you have and turn up to stuff. I know we can't do that in real life yet, but when we can and in the meantime online, I think you haven't got involved in activism until you're in a really cold town hall <laughs> drinking tea out of a paper cup one evening. So if it's something Thank you, you so care about that. locally, you know, and there's something going on, you know, whether it's online or real life, like turn up, that makes such an impact to people and think about what, skills that you have whether it's business skills or digital skills or you're a lawyer you know as well as the cash you know people that where, where you have genuine expertise um reach out and put that forward and then i think the other thing as well is particularly in the online space you know sophie touched on it before you know there is a lot of abuse and toxicity out there and actually words of kindness words of encouragement you know being someone that reaches out if someone if you are seeing someone having a hard time for standing up for a cause that you also agree with you know whether you do that publicly or privately to them I think things like that can really help keep someone going and make a difference especially if you see them kind of getting that kind of kick back on online awesome well time to activate.org is Sophie's uh, activation community breakthrough impact to august catherine's new exciting accelerator impact accelerator and there's this little uh venture called greenpeace which anthony is slowly rising up the ranks to one day solve the climate crisis for us if we just keep giving him some tweets and money thank you so much sophie walker for writing this amazing uh philosophical psychological practical toolkit for all our actions there it is. It's, not, it's more than one copy out here tonight. It's hundreds. And Anthony, thanks so much for your work at Greenpeace and being with us and Catherine for your for your amazing uh, journey so far and, and all the sharing and support you've given so many people.